There's things you could be doing to make your life better and to make life better for other people that you know perfectly well that you're not doing. And so if you stopped doing all the unnecessary things that make your life bad, then it would improve to some degree. Bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really. Really. Conditions of human life are such that suffering is an integral part of existence. Now, it's an important thing to understand. It's also a viewpoint shared by the bulk of the great religious systems of the world. Life is suffering. Why? One reason is because of society's arbitrary judgment. Every single one of us has traits and features and, and quirks and idiosyncrasies that are far from ideal and that are judged by the standards of society as insufficient. And so you suffer because of your imperfect insufficiency in the eyes of others. And, but the thing is, it doesn't matter what society it is, although they vary in the degree of their tyranny. The mere fact that you're grouped together with other people and have to come up with a common value structure in order to live together means that many of the things that characterize you are going to be suboptimal. And so the price you pay for social being is that much of you is deemed insufficient. Now hopefully there are various ways that you can be within a society that's sufficiently diverse so that you can find a place where what's good about you in the eyes of others and perhaps in your own eyes can flourish of its own accord because you don't have to be good at everything if you can be good at, at one thing well enough that might allow you your niche and hopefully a healthy society allows for that certainly societies can become so tyrannical that they don't so you can lay one source of human suffering at the feet of tyrannical social structures but the other element of it clearly is the mere fact of the arbitrariness of the natural world. If you have a lifespan that's going to be counted in the number of decades that you can count on two hands. And that has nothing to do technically with the tyranny of the social structure. Now you could say, if we got our act together more completely, perhaps you could live longer and fair enough. But the fact of the limits of your lifespan and the suffering that's necessarily a consequence of that, the death of your parents and the death of most people that you will know before you, means that that part of suffering is an integral part of existence itself. By the same token, you have your own responsibility for some of your unnecessary suffering because there's things you could be doing to make your life better and to make life better for other people that you know perfectly well that you're not doing. And so if you stopped doing all the unnecessary things that make your life bad, then it would improve to some degree that is not really computable because you don't know how far you could push that. So there's three reasons why you suffer, and one is, well, look at you and the way you're built. It's inevitable. There's not very much of you, and there's a lot of everything else. And so you just don't last that long, and you're fragile across multiple domains, and then you're harshly treated by society, and there's no doubt about that. And then there's responsibility that can be laid at your own feet. The proper pathway through that is to adopt the mode of authentic being. And that is something like refusing to participate in the lie, in deception and the lie, to orient your speech as much as you can towards the truth, and to take responsibility for your own life and perhaps also for the lives of other people. And there's something about that that's meaningful and responsible and noble. You need something to shelter you against your own vulnerability. If you're in a situation that's characterized by psychopathology, if there's something wrong with you mentally, that's a consequence of something gone wrong. But that's not the existentialist take. The existentialist take is, no, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. You don't have to necessarily have done anything wrong for things to get completely out of control. It's a terrifying doctrine, but it's not a hopeless doctrine because it still says that there's a way forward, there's a pathway forward. And the pathway forward is to adopt a mode of being that has some nobility so that you can tolerate yourself and perhaps even have some respect for yourself as someone who's capable of standing up in the face of that terrible vulnerability and suffering and that the pathway forward as far as the existentialists are concerned is by 
Well, certainly by the avoidance of deceit, particularly in language, but also by the adoption of responsibility for the conditions of existence and some attempt on your part to actually rectify them. And the thing that's so interesting about that is, well, two, as far as I'm concerned, and some of this is from clinical experience. You know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? You know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well, imagine that many people did that because we've done a lot as human beings. We've done a lot of remarkable things. About 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're making people, we're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that. But overall, the, the tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing. And we have no idea how fast we could multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. Because, you know, my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. Something, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done. That's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week. It's 100 hours a month. That's two and a half full work weeks. It's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50 if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. Because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not going to last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you. You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient people get. It's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. And that's the thing that's interesting too, is that, you know, there's this idea that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is, it's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. You don't have to listen to it, strangely enough. But you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, of course, exactly.
exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen, because you, you know, I knew this was going to happen. I got a warning it was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. So you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for ten years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you can be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you in all your ability and your catastrophe, and that's a very, very difficult thing to negotiate. But if you do negotiate it, well, at least you, you have something, you have somewhere solid to stand, and you have somewhere to live, you have a real life, and it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world, for example, because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death, which is what happens in a tremendously large minority of cases. Because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, seven billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that seven billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You know, you'll know a thousand people at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each. And that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence. It's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really ask yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters but I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. Now, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff. And I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering, but you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr. So that's a pretty good deal, all things considered, especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really, really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's a, light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends, because that's what happened in the 20th century. There are some dreams shut up in you. Like fire, you're going to feel your destiny calling out. May not have happened the first time. The loan didn't go through. You didn't get chosen for the part. The medical report wasn't good. That's okay. It's still in you. This is your time. This is your moment. Shake off the doubt. Shake off the negativity. You're at the right place. You're at the right time. Now all you've got to do is get in the right frame of mind. Lord, I believe this is my year to get healthy and whole. This is my year to meet the people of my dreams. This is my year to go further in my career, to step into a new level of my destiny. This is my year to accomplish dreams, to break free from this depression. This is my year to meet the right people. This is my year to get healthy and whole. This is your year to see double. 
This is your year for vindication, for restoration, for new beginnings. Now get your mind going in the right direction. This will be a transformative year. New year, new me. Transformative thinking. God is about to transform your thinking, your mindset, your approach to life. The Lord said that there's more inside of you than what you have perceived. There are gifts in you that you have not tapped into yet. This is your year of transformation, rethinking, removing, retooling, new friends, new environment. I'm tired of doing what I used to do. If I always do what I've always done, I'll always be where I've always been. I'm going to throw it behind me. Truth of the matter is everybody in here is going through a change. We are all in the process of transforming to a higher, better expression of myself. Don't let the habits of my past stop me from this metamorphosis. Things that used to worry me, not gonna do me like that. Things that used to get on my nerves. People I had to respond to in anger, not gonna do me like that. I'm focusing on what's in front of me. What separates us is transformation, the desire to evolve, the passion to get up off the ground and stop eating dirt. Your perception has everything to do with how this year is going to work. It is not what you perceive about me. It's what I perceive about me. It is because of the uniqueness of the challenges that confront you are so unique to you that you feel like I'm up against it all by myself. There are moments in our lives that we feel completely alone. We feel as though no one knows what we're going through. If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. Clarity is power. You've got to know the specific result you're after. What do you want? Why you're doing it? Most people will resist change. Most people will fight change as if change would be worse than what they're experiencing. Most people will not challenge the unknown. They won't just step out there. We go through the actions of commitment, but we're not really committed. We're not really connected. We're not really joined because we have no understanding of our responsibility to any relationship. Wonder what would have happened in school if you'd been committed. Wonder what would have happened in your marriage if you'd have really thrown your whole self. You've always been casual. See, a lot of people won't try anything different in life because they don't want to get hurt. Pain is everywhere. But most people spend their life not wanting to deal with the pain of rejection, the pain of being disappointed, the pain of being criticized, the pain, the pain. That's called life. But guess what? There's no gain without pain. Even if you were 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 doesn't matter. You're in the game now and that's what counts. And all those quote unquote wasted years, they, they weren't wasted because you learned. If you know what it is to be at the end of your rope and feel like your life is over and you've got questions that cannot be answered, you need to learn this verse, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I've seen days that were so dark for me that I thought there could not possibly be a silver lining in the clouds. I've seen days and weeks and months that drug me so low that I gave up all hope of getting up again. But in the midst of all of that despair, there was in the basement of my soul, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. So you got to get yourself past that. The way to get past that is have enough reasons. Reasons come first, answers come second. To ask intelligent, you got to know why you want it, have enough drive to make it happen, enough juice to make it happen. If you don't have enough reasons, you will not make it happen.
what is going to get you to actually fall through? Because the first plan's not going to work and the second plan's going to work, so you better have enough plans. If the first two don't work, you still got something else. Otherwise, you're going to be having excuses why it didn't work. What do you do when something is missing out of your life and the things that replaced it do not compensate for what you lost? What do you do when you tried and failed and you want to quit because trying again means hurting again, means risking again, means believing again, means hoping again? You will be wounded many times in your life. You'll make mistakes. But I have learned that failure is really God's way of saying, excuse me, you're moving in the wrong direction. Other than death, all failure is psychological. It does not mean that you won't lose some battles, because you will. But it does mean that as long as you don't surrender, as long as you don't give up, then you haven't failed. If you get beat, unless you're dead, you are not defeated and you have not failed. What you've done is you've learned. So get up and go get after it. You just don't know what the next moment will bring. You have comeback power when something happens to you. Don't buy into what has happened to you. Buy into, I'm getting up out of here. I'm going to change this situation. This is no time to do something stupid, like hurt yourself. No, 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 no. Don't lose your dream. That's long range goals. Because if you set up something short range, go for it, get it, latch, latch onto it, work hard, accomplish it. That starts building your strong feelings to go for your dreams. People who don't stop to clear their heads, they react, they don't respond. You're going to get through this, and you don't want to be radical. You don't want to be erratic. You've got to assure yourself. You have to encourage yourself. We all live in this bubble. What you got to do to get the life that God wants you to have, you got to put more air in your bubble. Expand yourself. Take yourself out your comfort zone. If you stay in your comfort zone, that's where you will fail. Success is not a comfortable procedure. It is a very uncomfortable thing to attempt. So you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable if you ever want to be successful. As long as God wakes you up, that means he ain't through with you yet. You got a shot to correct it and get it right. And he kept waking me up. So I figured, okay, God wakes you up. That also means that he has something for you that you've yet to receive. You have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people actually. The ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere, you know, when it got really tough. And the ones that didn't love it quit. So it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of worrying constantly. So you got to love it, you got to have passion. If you think ordinary's cool, ain't no problem. It's some really wonderful ordinary people. But here's the fact. All of you have extraordinary capabilities. All of you. You have to decide if you are willing to do the things to put you in that category. Rich people don't sleep eight hours a day. He who loves to sleep and the folding of hands, poverty will set upon you like a thief in the night. Better have a valued goal, because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation. And so the more valuable the goal, the more the microprocesses associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. Well, you get up in the morning and you're excited about the day. You're ready to go. What you do is you specify your long-term ideal. You want to specify goals that make you say, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. The question always is, why do something? It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, Oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, going, going and they're doing figure eights. So don't mistake movement for achievement. 
The next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? You need a family. You need friends. Like, you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, etc. You know, those are, that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's a bad deal for you. If you can't be good company to yourself, you can't be good company with anybody else. I, saw, I heard a song called, I'm lonely whenever you are around. Have you ever had that kind of experience? Yes, you have. We all, you could be lonely in the middle of a crowd, alone in your thoughts, people surrounding you, and you're lonely because you have a different kind of mindset. The energy is different. And your mind is in another place. There are people that are lonely who are living together. Unfortunately, there are people who are not handling it well. Don't just focus on how dramatic the change is. Focus on the area that's beneficial to you. Focus on what is it that you have going for you to negotiate the change. And so in this time where we are, that everybody would recognize that dramatic change has taken place. And many people are stressed out. Many people are frightened. Many people are confused and don't have a clue in what to do and feel overwhelmed. And so say to yourself, I am free to create a new life for myself. I'm aware of the fact that I have the ability to make my life recession proof. Right now, I am my boss. Who it is that you're trying to be, you aim at that, and then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And that's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. I would recommend that you don't let that happen. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living. Anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's going to be some suffering and loss involved in all of that. The goal is to have a vision for your life. Then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? 